afternoon. I'm Barbara Mead. I'm one of the founders of Politics and Prose, and I came in specifically for this occasion to honor the first publication of Stillhouse Press, uh, and uh, we have uh, three speakers uh, this afternoon who are going to talk about Wendy Kaufman. I didn't know Wendy. Um, uh, I was before her time. But uh, I know a number of people who, uh, who knew her very well, who just thought the world of her. First of all, our three uh, uh, speakers up here, uh, Susan Shreve, who is here this evening. Uh, I think Steve Goodwin is around here someplace. I know Alan Chu as well, who that uh, uh, I think Wendy worked for, um, uh, for his uh, program on uh, NPR. Uh, Wendy's husband and David and her two sons, uh, Eli and Alex, are here. Um, and if there are other people here who knew Wendy well, I hope that you will um, uh, stay and uh, join us for a reception. Of, we have some wine and some snacks and, uh, and talk to uh, uh, your colleagues and friends and our uh, speakers about your memories of uh, Wendy. Uh, it sounded like that uh, we could fill a room with those memories. Uh, first of all, I want to introduce Marcos Martinez. Um, Marcos is the editor uh, of Stillhouse Press. Uh, Stillhouse Press, I, I'm going to try to describe it correctly. If I'm not describing it correctly, I'm sure that Marcos will correct me. Um, Stillhouse Press is a collaboration between George Mason, Mason University's creative writing program and Fall for the Book, uh, which is a, uh, a fall festival and uh, literary event. Politics and Prose has always worked very closely with Fall for the Book. Um, Marcos is, uh, as I said, he's the editor of uh, Stillhouse Press. Um, he uh, is a, uh, he was born in Brownsville, Texas. He's lived in Alexandria for the last 18 years. Um, and he is a Lambda Literary Fellow. His work has appeared in Whiskey Island, The Washington Blade, and the Harvard Gay and Lesbian Review. Uh, Marcos is completing his Master's of Fine Arts in Fiction at George Ma uh, Mason University, and he knew Wendy well. So we're going to start with Marcos, and then we'll move on to our two other uh, guest panelists. So thanks for coming. Marcos. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for coming here today. I really appreciate you coming out on this cold afternoon. Um, as as uh, Barbara mentioned, Stillhouse Press is an independent publisher that's a student run out of George Mason University. Uh, we strive to publish both emerging and established writers whose work affirm the enduring power of the written word to inform and to delight. Uh, we're currently seeking book length manuscripts of literary nonfiction, fiction, and poetry. So if you know someone or have a manuscript, feel free to contact us on our website. Uh, we are so proud to have published Wendy Kaufman's collection, Helen on 86th Street and Other Stories, as our inaugural book. As Barbara mentioned, in addition to being a wonderful writer, Wendy Kaufman was a great supporter of other writers. She filled the roles of friend, advisor, editor, and protector. She was also a great teacher. She inspired students to treasure books and to believe in the importance of telling their own stories. Her generosity and encouragement led others to a world where books and writing became a large and meaningful part of their lives. I am pleased to announce the Wendy Kaufman Memorial Fund to honor Wendy's memory and her passion for working with other writers. Uh, if you're interested in this fund, you can contact Bill Miller, who's back here. He's a director of the Creative Writing Program at George Mason. Uh, and this fund will help support creative writing students at Mason University, uh, Wendy's alma mater. Please consider contributing to the Wendy's Memorial Fund. Any amount would be greatly appreciated. If you'd like more information, again, you can contact myself or Bill Miller. I was very fortunate to be one of the people touched by Wendy's work, and I wish most of all that she was here to read from her collection, Helen on 86th Street. Uh, Wendy died August 27th after living with cancer for nearly four years. Only a few hours after she passed away, the first copies of Helen arrived from the printer. I like to think that she left us and came right back. Her voice in this collection of stories is a magnetic blend of strength, humor, and compassion. 
the same caring spirit that she possessed in life is vivid on the pages and focused on her characters. Young women in difficult situations, always aware that the other shoe is about to drop. To quote from Wendy's story, Trist and Doubt, this is the type of wisdom she dispenses, the truth of the ages, handed down from woman to woman in an unbroken chain. Thank you all for being here today. Okay, next we have Mary Kay Zaravlev, uh, who I know well from politics and prose, and I'm sure that a number of people in the audience uh, know Mary Kay well from, from politics and prose. I've introduced Mary Kay several times for her novels. She has, uh, uh, um, many years ago, she had her first novel here at po Politics and Prose, Frequency of Souls. Uh, she went on to write another uh, novel that was just wonderfully received, The Bowl is Already Broken. And then just uh, uh, within the past year, she uh, published Man Alive. Well, she didn't publish it. Forrest Strauss published it. Published it. And uh, to, uh, with a wonderful uh, 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 insert written by the editor Jonathan Galassi about the book. It was just, it's just a, a, a wonderful book. Um, Mary Kay has uh, uh, taught uh, writing at American University, Johns Hopkins University, and George Mason University. And she's written uh, and edited extensively for the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, she serves on the board of Penn Faulkner um, with Susan Shreve, and as along with Susan also, is co-founder of the DC Women Writers Group. Uh, she's a, uh, a real stalwart in the writers community in Washington. She's a great supporter of writers, and it's not surprising to me at all that she was one of the biggest fans of Wendy Kaufman. So here's Mary Kay to talk, to talk about, and she'll read some from uh, Wendy's work. Who do you think I learned that from? Real stalwart in the writing community, <laughs> bringing people together. Um, this is, I remember seeing Edwidge Danticat here one time and she said, we're going to laugh, we're going to cry together. And so here we are together again to toast to Wendy, a well-deserved toast for a beautiful book. And I've been privileged to be at some of the other um, ceremonies and celebrations of her life, really. Um, exquisite work and people that she surrounded herself with. And it's great to be at Politics and Prose. She was often here supporting other writers, and we often got to see her here. Um, I'm extremely lucky that they asked me, uh, the people at Stillhouse Press and Wendy asked me to write the introduction to this book. So what that meant was that Wendy and I got to have a long conversation after I had really read the work. I got to call her and we got to talk. And, you know, who of your friends do you remember just about every conversation you've had with? And I, I you know, I got to tell her that a couple times, that we would have these talks and then I would sort of chew on it and I would think, oh yeah, when I saw Wendy three months ago outside, you know, at this, at this lunch or at this reading, I mean, I really remember almost every conversation that I got to have with her, which is pretty amazing. Um, you know that Wendy taught, she taught university, high school students, she taught doctors, she taught her girls. Her girls who had, um, were, had offenses that they had to make up for. And so the judge would sort of sentence them to this 10-week program through the Fairfax Library. Um, and Wendy was their teacher in a writing course. And she would help them read books about other women who had made bad choices and who had had things done to them, maybe worse, maybe not as bad as things that had happened to these girls, and had rebounded or had gone under and she would have them write to sort of get access to their emotions. And then, at the end, they would have this event where the girls, the girls' parents, the judges who sentenced them, the lawyers who were present at the event, they would have a reading, and people would laugh and cry together. So it was an amazing program that she was part of. She was very, very proud of these girls. And, um, and she taught doctors how to be human beings. I mean, <laughs> you know, who can do that? Um, so. Uh, I'm sure there are many doctors in the house who I respect dearly. And uh, <laughs> so she taught literature and empathy, and she talked about um, 
speaking books as a second language, which I just love. Um, I want to tell two stories about her, and I just hit that age where, as a friend of mine's mother says, don't stop me if I've told you this before. Um, <laughs> so one of, his, one of them is that Steve Goodwin told me she always uh, brought, the, you know, she brought the life to the party. She, everybody raised their game when Wendy was in the room. And that was so true. You didn't show off, you just got better. She just made everybody smarter. And I was trying to describe her to someone who hadn't met her, and I said, she didn't hog the spotlight. The spotlight found her wherever she was. And um, she was the eye of the storm. She was wildly smart. She was wildly smart emotionally as well as intellectually. She was generous. She was irreverent. She was glamorous. And probably all of you read her blog. She was one of the first bloggers I ever followed, The Happy Booker, which was feisty and irreverent and really open-hearted. I mean, it really, really brought attention to a lot of other writing in Washington. Um, so uh, I remember a party at her house in Scott's honor for his first book, Grand Avenue, and uh, which is about uh, L'Enfant's plan for Washington, and she hired a Washington impersonator. <laughs> and he was great. He was really good at what he did. And he also had so much fun that he began polling the audience to see who had other books coming up and who he could impersonate for other parties. <laughs> and he kept saying, I do a mean Jefferson. I do a really good Jefferson. I do, I do Adams late in his life. I do. So you know, he wanted to come back to the next party that they had at their house. Um, all right, so what else do I want to tell you about? I just thought I was reading today a, a book that was describing Charlie Chaplin and how he was irreverent and feisty, and I thought, boy, those are two good words to describe Wendy. And, um, and as I said, I would add, um, incredibly generous. She was so helpful to all of us, and we really wanted to be uh, as helpful as we could to her. So I'm going to read from Visitation Rights, and um, this... It's hard to pick a story in this book to read from because they are so wonderful. And her ability to capture voice is um, really to be used in any course you might be teaching in the future. So this is, I'm just going to start reading from about a third of the way in. My mother doesn't believe in anything she hasn't seen herself firsthand. And she's seen a lot. She has visions. Usually they happen around dinner time after her second scotch and soda, minus the soda. She can see around corners, knows who is about to ring the doorbell, what grades I get in school, when the phone will ring. But those are minor things. Her big showstopper is that she can communicate with the dead. She has the ability to deliver messages from the other side, a talent that's always strongest in November. It's the weather, she always says, pulling her sweater in close around her. Less interference this time of year. For some reason, dinner is the perfect time for other world guests to drop by. It is not unusual for my mother to look up from a steaming plate of food and announce that a recently deceased friend, neighbor, or relative is with us. Mrs. Abrams is now in the room, my mother says, in a welcoming voice, putting down her soup spoon and smiling. Pearl Abrams was the previous owner of our house. She died the summer after we moved in. She wants to see what we've done with the place, she says. How does she look, my father asks, not looking up from his plate. Not bad, my mother says. More tan than I remember like she just came back from Miami Beach. Novembers are always a busy time for spirit traffic around the house. Once in the middle of the night, all the dogs in the neighborhood started howling, keening the same low moan. The sound woke me up and sent me running to my parents' room, terrified that something was horribly wrong. Shh, don't be scared, my mother said, lifting the blankets and moving over to make room for me in her bed. I settled down into the warm spot where her body had just been. It's Harry Stevens from across the street, she said, mentioning the neighbor boy who had drowned while away at summer camp. He wants his mother to know he's all right, that he's just late getting home. I fell back to sleep that night, snuggled in close, curled up under her arm, a baby chick under the wing, while she continued her conversation in low murmured tones with a boy I could not see. My grandmother draws the line at nocturnal visits from the other world. If you can't stop by at a decent hour, don't bother, she says. <laughs> I can't be up all night communing with the spirits. I need my beauty rest. Things between my grandmother and mother never go smoothly. Their connection is strong and volatile, filled with high drama and hurt feelings. I guess it's easier for their feelings to get hurt when they can read each other's minds. During their many arguments, it's not unusual for my mother to point at the phone seconds before it rings and say, that's your grandmother, tell her I'm not here. My grandmother does the same, waving a finger toward the old black wall phone and announcing, your mother is about to call, please ignore it. 
When my mother and grandmother are on speaking terms, all is right with the world. My grandmother calls for long phone chats, and my mother always lets me speak to her first. I hold the receiver close to my ear and listen to my grandmother's soft voice and the gentle swish, swish of tarot cards in the background. Those cards are her constant companion, and she keeps them either in her hands or wrapped in a square piece of linen tucked tightly under her pillow while she sleeps. Cards, tea leaves, palms, my grandmother reads them all. Everything is a sign, a warning, a prediction. It rained the day my mother married my father, on a day that called for sunshine and blue skies. God's tears, my grandmother said. Her disapproval of my mother's marriage, no secret. It's a sign, she said. This should not happen. My grandmother has never approved of my mother's marriage. My father is 25 years older than my mother and working on his third marriage, not exactly what my grandmother had in mind for her only daughter. She and my mother didn't speak for 13 months after my parents were married until I was born. Now my grandmother takes an active hand in my raising and I spend weekends, holidays, entire summers in the same brownstone where my mother was raised, sleeping in her childhood bed, playing with what is left of her toys. I am entirely devoted to my grandmother, her constancy and unconditional love. But when it comes to training me to read cards, to see the next foot about to fall, I'm hopeless. You'll get it one day, my grandmother always promises. Don't feel bad. You're just a late bloomer. The November I turned 12, my mother's ex-boyfriend, Willie, starts visiting. On long, cold evenings when my father is out at a committee or local council meeting, Willie stops by. He was a pharmacist, shot dead in the street in Sheepshead Bay on his way to visit my mother. Now he has finally found his way back to her. On these nights, the house fills with the strong smell of pipe smoke and bourbon, a strange combination, so strong that even I, who usually see nothing, can't deny it. What is that, I ask my mother. Go to your room, she says. I have some unfinished business here. <laughs> Willie's visits leave my mother weepy, have her refreshing her drink several times and singing It Had to Be You in a throaty, off-kilter voice. I lie on my bedroom floor next to the heat register, listening to her sing and waiting for my father to come home. When he does, his voice mixes with my mother's and rises with the warm air to the second story of our house, finding its way through the register to my ear. Each snippet of conversation comes with a warm blast of air, calming me until I feel sleepy and reassured that everything will be all right. The year I turn 12, my mother ships me off to my grandmother's with an overnight bag and the promise of a quick return. I need some time to rest, she says. It's time, my grandmother says. You're almost grown up, a woman. We need to have an important talk about how things work in this world. You should know some things. We are sitting in her yellow kitchen at a Formica top table, flecked with gold stars. If this is about getting my period, we've already had that talk in school, I tell her, trying to act bored by the whole topic. Please, she says, this is about energy. People give off a color or a feeling. It's time for you to learn these things. Has your mother taught you nothing? Look at me, look hard, and you will be able to see it. I look for what feels like hours, trying, sitting, squinting my eyes, staring at her until my vision becomes blurry and doubled. Nothing. Relax, she says. You're looking the wrong way. Try it again. Only this time, close your eyes. My parents call two days after their Guy Fox party. My grandmother sends me out of the room before the phone rings, even though I can hear her clearly through the wall, warning my mother about the dangers of missed school and truancy. I don't have to be psychic to hear my mother's full-throated laugh, her voice when she says to her mother, Missy has enough to learn from you. Don't worry about a few missed school days. Don't worry about your parents, my grandmother says when she hangs up the phone. Unfortunately, they will be just fine. <laughs> I find this reassuring and watch as my grandmother lays her cards out in a simple cross on the table. I'm not allowed to touch her deck. The cards are worn thin, and in places the light actually shows through. For the first time, I'm given my own deck, a bright yellow box with a magician on the cover. I'm told to copy her pattern with stiff cards that do not bend easily in an unpracticed hand. I'm 12 years old. I miss my parents, and this is a game that does not interest me. Look at the pictures, my grandmother tells me. Don't worry about the words or what they are supposed to mean. Just look. Tell me what you see. I look closely at the patterns, the colors of hair and images of water, women in gowns, men in armor. Look at the wands, my grandmother says, pronouncing it as wants. The coins, the cups. I don't know what I see, I say. It just looks like a bunch of stupid pictures. They don't make any sense to me. Let me try your deck. My grandmother is reluctant to part with her cards. 
Here, I will lay them out for you. Look at them and just tell me a story. Say something, anything. It doesn't have to be true. What kind of a story isn't true, I ask? Some of the best ones, she says. Thank you. Well, you can see why that uh, Wendy was such an appealing author. author. Um, now, uh, an, another uh, uh, a teacher of Wendy's, Scott Berg, uh, is going to uh, talk about Wendy and, re and read. Uh, Scott is also a very familiar face in politics and prose. Uh, he's, I've introduced him here twice for two books that are published by Pantheon Books, which is a, uh, a powerhouse of literary nonfiction. Uh, first, um, he wrote a book about uh, uh, Pierre L'Enfant, Grand Avenues. I think that was first, wasn't it? Yeah, yes. And then uh, 38 Nooses about Lincoln and uh, Little Crow. Uh, Scott uh, comes from, uh, he was raised in Minnesota. Uh, he got his BA in architecture from the University of Minnesota and then an MA in English from Miami University in Ohio. And he received his MFA in creative writing from George Mason University, where he now teaches nonfiction writing and literature. And he also uh, could contributes to the Washington Post and many other publications. So here's Scott to tell us a little bit more about Wendy. Scott. Hello. Um, Mary Kay didn't mention it, and she doesn't need to, but she's got three great books. Um, my wife worked in the uh, Washington art uh, community, uh, museum community, for about 10 years, and um, Mary Kay's second book, The Bowl is Already Broken, is the best possible novel that could ever be written about that uh, community, so I couldn't recommend it more highly. I just want to say a few things um, about... Uh, Wendy, in her writing, um, Wendy didn't publish all that much writing. And what I mean by this is this book, with a few exceptions, things that she didn't want in here, shorter things, this is, this is her output of published work. And these have been published in wonderful places, including The New Yorker. Um, but there are ways to measure influence. And uh, if we measure Wendy's influence by the amount of writing for which she was responsible, uh, including our own, we get a, a, a rather amazing picture. It's wonderful to be sitting up here with Barbara and Mary Kay because they're cut from the very same cloth. People that seem to, you know, lift all boats uh, and create a, a rapidly rising tide. Um, Wendy uh, wasn't into sports, um, especially organized, you know, professional sports, and she wasn't all that keen on sports metaphors, which is why it's kind of pleasing to offer you a sports metaphor when he had some, a few, she scored a few goals and they were spectacular, but she was the kind of person who racked up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of assists. Um, and she was very, very, very concerned that the writers around her uh, succeed in their craft and in their art, but yes, in their uh, commercial success as well. She had all kinds of suggestions all the time. And just in this room alone, there are several people that owe not only some of the quality of their work, but the fact uh, they owe their agents and their, and their publishers um, to Wendy, which is why it's so nice that Stillhouse has been able to sort of, in a manner, reciprocate that favor. Um, Wendy's passing sort of, you know, denied us of, of more great writing, but I, I think the thing, in addition, I'm talking about writing now because the person matters most, of course, but in addition to the lost writing that we never got to read, what we really missed out on is the growth and continuing maturation of the literary salon that she was building. Um, it's nothing, it, it's no exaggeration to say again there are a whole lot of people in this room who are writers who were really looking forward to all of our kids being gone out of the house and 
her backyard or her porch or her front porch and being able to sit on that porch for hours and hours and hours on the end and talking about writing and as Mary Kay said laughing about writing crying about writing talking about writing and um, as readers again as writers as as supporters of other readers and writers. At Wendy's memorial service, I read the very end of Helen on 86th Street, the title story of this co collection. I'm going to read a little bit more of it. Instead of two pages, I'm going to read about four at the end of that story. I love reading that story, and I'm glad I've had a chance to do it a couple of times. Um, it's no disservice to any of the rest of her work to say that, and I know a lot of folks have this experience that that she she caught lightning in a bottle with this story that I heard Tim O'Brien ages ago, the writer Tim O'Brien talk about how sometimes stories just it's like kids they go up and they even though you've loved them from the start and you put all kinds of care into them they go on to do these things you never you know, you never would have imagined they would do, and I feel Helen on Eighty Sixth Street it's a pastiche of the Odyssey it was written for Alan a class of Alan Shoes at George Mason University it was published by the New Yorker, it's anthologized in several um, very commonly adopted uh, literature textbooks in high school. It's taught all over the country, including in Northern Virginia. It's taught by one, one, of the, one of the high school teachers in attendance here teaches her story. And I just think the, cool, the story is about a girl in high school. I'm not going to give you much setup or context for this except to say that the narrator uh, will be landing herself in what I read, the, the role of Helen of Troy in the school play, and we're coming up to opening night. Um, in addition, she's wondering where her absent father might be, uh, if in fact he's been absent for a while, parts unknown, um, if he might in fact show up in the audience. And if you'd like to read the rest of the story, well, of course, we, uh, Stillhouse Press is set up over here. I want to remind you that um, if after I'm done reading, if you have uh, questions um, for any of the people up here about Stillhouse or any of the folks serving you wine and cookies and other goodies over there, please ask. I want to remind you that there is a fund, a, a scholarship fund in Wendy's name that um, any support, small or large, again, Marcos or Bill, um, can uh, you know you can talk to them about that uh, and find out um, so without further ado again about the last four pages of Helen on 86th Street it's all my fault Helen McGuire who was originally slated to be Helen Troy Helen McGuire has chicken pox bad she's been out of school for almost two weeks I know I'm responsible. The show must go on, Mr. Dodd said when Achilles threw up the tater tots or when Priam's beard got caught in Athena's hair, but this is different. This is Helen, and it's my fault. I know all her lines, know them backward and forward. I've stood in our living room, towel tied around my body, and acted out the entire play, saying every line for my mother. When Mr. Dodd makes the announcement about Helen at dress rehearsal, I stand up, white bed sheets slipping from my shoulders, and I say in a loud, clear voice, the gods must have envied me my beauty, for now my name is a curse. I have become hated Helen, the scourge of Troy. Mr. Dodd shakes his head and looks very sad. We'll see, Vita. She, she might still get better. Helen McGuire recovers, but she doesn't want to do the part because all of the pockmarks. Besides, she wants to be inside the horse with Tommy Aldridge. <laughs> Mr. Dodd insists that she still be Helen until her parents write that they don't want her to be pressured. They don't want to do any further damage, whatever that means. After that, the part is mine. Tonight is the opening, and I am so excited. Mom is coming without old Farfel, her father. He wasn't what I wanted, she said. I don't think she'll be seeing him anymore. Sorry, not her father, her boyfriend. What is beautiful? 
I ask mom before the play begins. Why are you so worried all the time about beauty? Don't you know how beautiful you are? Would daddy think I was beautiful? Oh, Vita, he always thought you were beautiful. Would he think I was like Helen? She looks me up and down from the gold lanyard snake through my thick hair to my too tight pink ballet slippers. He would think you're more beautiful than Helen. I'm almost sorry he won't be here to see it. Almost sorry? Almost. At moments like this, you look so good those ancient gods are going to come alive again with envy. What do you mean, come alive again? What are you saying about the gods? Vita, Greek polytheism is an extinct belief, she says, and laughs. And then she stops and looks at me strangely. When people stop believing in the gods, they no longer had power. They don't exist anymore. You must have known that. Didn't I get the part of Helen? Didn't old Farfel leave? I made all these things happen. I know I did. I don't believe the gods disappeared, at least not Athena. I don't believe you, I say. She looks at me confused. You can't know for sure about the gods, and who knows? Maybe Daddy will even be here to see it. Sure, she says, and maybe this time the Trojans will win the war. I stand off stage with Mr. Dodd and wait for my final cue. The dry ice machine has been turned on full blast, and an incredible amount of fake smoke is making its way toward the painted backdrop of Troy. Hector's paper mache head has accidentally slipped from Achilles' hand and is now making a hollow sound as it rolls across the stage. I peek around the thick red curtain, trying to see into the audience. The auditorium is packed, filled with parents and camcorders. I spot my mom sitting in the front row, alone. I try to scan the back wall, looking for a sign of him, a familiar shadow. Nothing. Soon I will walk out on the ramparts, put my hand to my forehead, and give my last speech. Are you sure you're ready? Mr. Dodd asks. I think he's more nervous than I am. Remember, he tells me, this is Helen's big moment. Think loss. I nod, thinking nothing. Break a leg, he says, giving me a little push toward the stage. Try not to trip over the head. The lights are much brighter than I expected, making me squint. I walk through the smoky fog towards center stage. It is I, the hated Helen, scourge of Troy. With the light on me, the audience is in shadow, like a big pit, dark and endless. I bow before the altar, feeling my tunic rise. Hear my supplication, I say, pulling down a bit on the back of my tunic. Do not envy me such beauty. It has wrought only pain and despair. I can hear Mr. Dodd offstage loudly whispering each line along with me. For this destruction, I know I will be blamed. Blamed, Mr. Dodd whispers. His timing is a beat behind mine. I begin to recite Helen's wrongs, beauty, pride, the abdication of Sparta, careful to enunciate clearly. Troy, I have come to ask you to forgive me. I'm supposed to hit my fist against my chest, draw a hand across my forehead, and cry loudly. Mr. Dodd has shown me this gesture, practiced it with me in rehearsal a dozen times, the last line, my big finish. The audience is very quiet. In the stillness, there is a hole, an empty pocket, an absence. Instead of kneeling, I stand up, straighten my tunic, look toward the audience, and speak the line softly, and to say goodbye. There is a prickly feeling up the back of my neck, and then applause. The noise surrounds me, filling me. I look into the darkened house, and for a second, I can hear the beating of a swan's wings, and then nothing at all. Thanks for coming.